Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us. I'm Nicole Porter, Senior Director of Advocacy for the Sentencing Project. Thank you for joining us for this virtual pre-launch event. In the coming days, the Sentencing Project will be officially launching a year-long public education campaign designed to awaken everybody in America to the far-reaching impacts of ma mass incarceration and a criminal legal system in need of transformation. Today's discussion will preview this effort. I'd like to request any journalists or reporters in the audience to hold the embargo until we officially launch in a few weeks. Feel free to reach out with any questions. We wanted to start the public education campaign early and share messaging toolkits, which can be found at sentencingproject.org with advocacy partners, including the directly impacted organizers to brief you on this work and invite you to join us in the weeks and months ahead through 2023. We will, want, we will launch this effort in a few weeks with trailblazing new research on the nation's mass incarceration problem. But today, Nazgul Ganoush, co-director of research for the Sentencing Project, will give a sneak peek into the data behind the past 50 years of mass incarceration, followed by reactions from our esteemed panel. Our panel includes colleagues who will partner with us over the next year to call attention to 2023 as an important year to acknowledge in the history of the nation's mass incarceration problem. The title for this campaign, 50 Years and a Wake Up, Ending the Mass Incarceration Crisis in America, was born out of a phrase that incarcerated people sometimes use to describe the length of their sentence plus one day. For example, I have 20 years and a wake up. So in effect, wake up in the campaign title is calling for everyone to wake up to the dangerous realities of mass incarceration. Before Nazgul provides us with an overview of the data, I'd like to introduce our panel. Ronald Simpson Bay joins us. Ronald served 27 years of incarceration and works as the executive vice president for Just Leadership USA and is a 2015 Leading with Conviction Fellow. He is a national decarceration leader committed to cutting the number of people under correctional supervision in half by 2030. Ronald does policy advocacy work with the Michigan Collaborative to End Mass Incarceration and community organizing with the Nation Outside Organization for Returning Citizens. We're also joined by Ebony Underwood, who is a social entrepreneur, content creator, advocate, and an Aspen Institute Ascend Fellow. Ebony founded We Got Us Now in 2017 as the first of its kind national nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy organization built by, led by, and about children and young adults impacted by parental incarceration. We're also joined by my longtime colleague, Monica Reed, who serves as the Senior Director of Advocacy at the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. In this capacity, Monica manages NACDL state legislative criminal justice reform efforts and the day-to-day -day grassroots advocacy operations, including coordinating NACDL's efforts to mobilize its members, state affiliate organizations, and other partner organizations. These aren't all our partners. We are also grateful to be partnering with faith partners like the Festival Center, Interfaith Working Group, the ACLU, the Vera Institute for Justice, the Brennan Center, Human Rights for Kids, and the American Bar Association. And we hope to welcome more as this important effort moves forward throughout 2023. So with that welcome, and I'd like to turn it over to my colleague Nazgul, who will get us started with a data overview for why 2023 marks 50 years of mass incarceration. Nazgul. Thank you so much, Nicole, for bringing us together. I'm really honored to be among these panelists um, who have offered so much guidance to me in, as a researcher, as well as so much inspiration. So it's great to be with you all. And thank you everyone for joining. So um, I wanna start off by saying that the Sentencing Project's research team has many plans this year for highlighting this grim milestone. Several of our publications will explore this theme, and we've planned related panels at academic conferences, some including people who have uh, personally experienced incarceration. Today, we published an overview of key mass incarceration trends uh, produced by my colleague, Ashley Nellis, with whom I co-direct research at the Sentencing Project. At this webinar, I'm gonna go over some of the highlights of that report and other publications to give you context about what 
uh, the, fast, the past 50 years has brought us and to help shape the path ahead. So I'm gonna show you a number of charts, but I promise to also show, also show a number of pictures. So let me walk you through this first chart here. Uh, this chart shows that until the 1970s, the prison population in the United States was always under 200,000 people. And then it grew in 1973, and that's the first red bar that you can see in this chart, and it broke the 200,000 barrier. It then grew dramatically every single year until 2009, when the prison population reached a peak of nearly 1.6 million people. And that's the second red bar in this chart. And there are additionally several hundred thousand people in jails. Fortunately, the prison population has trended downwards since 2009. So there's been a 25% reduction in the prison population count by 2021, which was the last year for which we have data nationally. Still, the, the 1.2 million people that are in prison that were imprisoned in 2021 represent a 500% increase in the U.S. prison population over the past 50 years. We remain fully in the era of mass incarceration with one of the highest rates of incarceration in the world. Let me try to get to my next slide. I'm a little stuck here. Hmm. Okay, here we go. Okay, so what's interesting about the international comparison is that researchers have shown that over two dozen other countries experience the crime, the crime trends that are shown here for the United States, though the United States is unusual in having a much higher homicide rate due in part to our prevalence of guns. Crime rates increased in the 1970s in the United States as they did in many other countries, and they reached their peak level in the 1990s. By year end 2019, before the pandemic began, reported rates of crime fell to about half the rate that they were at in the 1990s. They did that in the United States and they did so in over two dozen other countries that did not increase incarceration levels like we did. But the United States increased incarceration levels while crime rates were increasing. And we continue to increase incarceration levels even while crime rates were falling. And that's because of policies and practices that were implemented during the past 50 years of mass incarceration. So these include mandatory minimum sentences, so-called truth and sentencing laws, and harsh prosecutorial charging and plea practices. In 2020, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, violent crime rates increased and homicides spiked uh, and while property crimes continued to decline. Policymakers now have to effectively tackle this uptick in lethal violence using evidence-based solutions while correcting the counterproductive, cruel, and costly policies of the past that led to mass incarceration. We've seen clearly in the last 50 years that crime rates and imprisonment levels have no consistent relationship with each other. In order to end mass incarceration, if we wanted to cut our prison population back to the level that it was at before mass incarceration began, we'd have to cut imprisonment levels by 87% from the peak that they were at in 2009. That's a really big reduction. But one thing we know is that the US youth justice system has already achieved reductions close to this magnitude. The number of youth held in juvenile facilities fell from a peak of 109,000 in the year 2000 to 25,000 in 2020. That's a 77% reduction. There's still more to be done to ensure that children's lives matter and particularly that black children's lives matter. But the progress in the youth justice system suggests that ending mass incarceration within our lifetime is a possibility. So I wanna talk a bit about racial disparities in incarceration and the good news and the bad news that we've seen there. So we can see from the research that we've done as well as in-depth studies that have been done by the National Academy of Sciences and the Council on Criminal Justice that we've made a lot of progress, but that disparities continue to persist. 
in the past 20 years, we've significantly reduced the rate of imprisonment for Black women, as well as to some ex to a smaller extent for Black men as well. So we've narrowed racial disparities in incarceration, but still Black women, Black men are imprisoned at nearly six times the rate of white men, and Black women are imprisoned at nearly twice the rate of white women. And significant racial disparities persist also among the Latinx population and among American Indians whose figures are not shown here. So we have a lot of work to do still to achieve equity. And I also want to highlight a point that Marie Gottschalk, a scholar at University of Pennsylvania, has shared, which is that even if we achieve imprisonment levels in the United States that we see for white Americans, for people of color, if the total imprisonment level that we saw across the board was the same as it was for white Americans, that would not be enough to end mass incarceration. We need to reduce imprisonment levels for, for people of color, and we also need to continue to go beyond reductions that we've seen and beyond the rates that we've seen among white Americans even to mass, end mass incarceration. In recent years, we've seen growing understanding that we can't end mass incarceration without tackling the high rates of imprisonment for violent crimes, which range from robbery and assault to rape and murder. People with violent convictions make up over half of the prison population, and they're represented by the top line in this chart. By year end 2019, when violent crime rates in the United States had fallen to half the level that they were at in the 1990s, the number of people in prison for a violent crime had declined by only 2% since it reached its peak level in 2009. We've made more progress, but still not enough in reducing imprisonment levels for drugs and property crimes. But we have a long way to go to scale back prison admissions and prison sentence lengths for violent crimes. And the slow pace of decarceration for violent, violent crimes is at odds with evidence that long sentences incapacitate older people who pose little public safety risk, that these sentences produce limited deterrent effects, that they do little to prevent others from committing crimes, and they detract us from making much more effective investments in public safety. People age out of criminal activity, and that's one reason that the sentencing project is working to end life imprisonment and why we support expansive second look reforms. People re released after decades of imprisonment for the most serious crimes, like those pictured here who were released as a result of the Unger versus Maryland court decision, have extremely low recidivism rates. Our research has shown that the prison population serving a life sentence today is larger than the total prison population in 1970. What I'd like you to notice from this picture is the old age of the individuals, as well as the fact that they're overwhelmingly African American. Nationally, almost half of people serving life sentences are African American. And in some states like Maryland, about three quarters of the life sentence population are African American. This means that we have to tackle racial bias that promotes uh, ineffective, extreme, uh, and extreme sentences for serious crimes, rather than helps us to pursue more effective policies that result in criminal victimization. Here's another look at this trend of racial disparity growing with sentence lengths. So the bar on the left shows the percentage of the general, the total American population, that's African-American, that's 14%. The middle bar shows the percentage of the prison population that's African American, and that's 33%. And the bar on the right shows the prison population that is serving a sentence of 10 years or longer, and the proportion that is African American there is 46%. So you can see that the proportion of people who are African American in the 10 plus year group in prison is higher than the overall prison population itself. And then I just want to conclude with two points about how broad the impacts of mass incarceration are beyond the people that are given felony convictions and that are serving these sentences. So first, we know that half of people in prison are parents of young children, and so several million children have experienced parental incarceration. We know from the National Institute of Justice that there are many harmful effects of parental incarceration on children, including psychological stress and economic hardship. These harms disproportionately impact children of color, especially black children. 
And the second example of the broad reach of mass incarceration that I want to highlight is the effects on our democracy. This photo de depicts people in Nebraska who were advocating for a bills that would restore voting rights to the um, to Nebraskans who had completed their sentences and are living in communities. Uh, nationwide, over four and a half million Americans cannot vote because of a felony conviction. Most of these people, over three quarters of them, are living in our communities. They've either completed their sentences or they're on community supervision, such as parole or probation. Th these harms of limited access to our democracy disproportionately impact people of color and, again, disproportionately impact Black Americans. Nationwide, over 5% of the Black voting age population is disenfranchised because of a felony conviction, and the rate is much higher in some states. Advocacy to reinstate voting rights for people with a felony conviction, as represented by this photo, can help to ensure that we end mass incarceration within our lifetime and move us towards more effective and less harmful public safety solutions. Stop there. Thank you, Nazgul. So um, we're going to get into a conversation with our panelists and I want to invite our panelists to turn off their camera so we can come um, onto the screen and get into a dialogue. I notice a lot of feedback and comments in the chat. I want to encourage folks who have questions to ask them in the Q&A uh, function of this webinar so that we can get to them um, after our panel discussion. We will have time for Q&A this afternoon and thank you all for your enthusiasm and thank you for being here. We have several hundred people on so it's very exciting. Um, that folks want to join us in this pre-launch event. Again, want to um, ask any journalist or reporters who are in the audience to respect the embargo. This is a pre-launch event. The sentencing project is taking the time to preview this information for our partners who've joined us here today and others who aren't on the call, and also for other partners who are in the audience that we want to welcome to support us and work with us over the next year during this public education effort. But with that, I want to turn to our panelists, to Ron, to Monica, to Ebony, and ask you all for your feedback, for your reactions to Nazgul's presentation. So Ron, we'll start with you. Thank you, Nicole. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ronald simpson Bate, Executive Vice President of Just Leadership USA. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. And Nazgul, thank you for such a powerful presentation. It's like you know, no matter how many times I hear and, and seen those numbers over the years, they still, every time I see them, they blow me away. And I think one of my first initial thought is uh, a saying that our president, uh, Deanna Hoskin, president and CEO of Just Leadership USA, she always says that the correction system is a catch basin for all the other failed systems in our society. The education school system, the transportation, housing, employment, all the failed systems in our society um, it's like the, they dump everything into the correct correction. So we end up with these 2 million plus people incarcerated. We know in the United States that, you know, we only make up 25% of the world, a quarter of the world's population, but we have a quarter of the prison population. So it's, it's crazy. So to see those numbers in, in, in stark reality, it just, it still chills me. And thanks for sharing that, Nasco. Thank you, Ron. I want to go to you, Ebony, for any reactions or feedback you have. Yeah, yeah, first of all, again, thank you. My name is Ebony Underwood. I'm the founder CEO of We Got Us Now. Uh, Nazgul, excellent presentation. Um, again, just to uh, echo what, what uh, Ron just said, I agree, like seeing these numbers in real time and just understanding the depth of what has happened over the course of 50 years is, is honestly really heartbreaking. And so, um, Happy to be in this conversation and happy to know that we are actually addressing this huge ass elephant in the room um, that we haven't addressed in a long time. And so many, there's so many rippling effects from this that I am um, just elated to be in this conversation and know that this community is uplifting this very, very important subject. Thank you, Ebony. And last but not least, Monica, let's go to you for your reactions. Thank you so much, Nicole. So echoing um, everyone's sentiments, so glad to be here, um, to be in partnering with the Sentencing Project and all of the other wonderful organizations who are participating in this campaign. Um, and, and also echoing sort of great presentation and sort of uh, helping to frame this issue. I wanted to point out though, so some of the things that stuck out with me is sort of the, the need, I think you had even mentioned the NASCO in terms of 
uh, the need and the focus um, needing to be on extreme sentences and more sort of uh, those that fall under violent offenses. Um, because I think as we talk about you know, this campaign, it's going to be lifting up and highlighting, and educating. But really, when we talk about sort of those on the ground and advocates and include, including inclusive of us, right, in terms of how we're approaching policy reforms when we're talking to uh, legislators when we're working in coalition, uh, we really do sort of in the not needing so to leave out anyone really need to start, not say start, but really, I think this campaign is going to really show the need to focus on uh, long sentences, violent offenses. Um, I know East Sentencing Project, um, and we've worked in partner with you guys and us as well, in terms of modeling even like second look legislation, right, sort of tackling um, the issue of extreme sentences after the fact, but really needing to sort of lift up that your chart, I, one of them, when it was showing sort of like um, the rate of reduction, I think 2% for violent offenses and then like drug offenses, 30 words. So we really see like right, right where sort of we're seeing the reduction in the prison population and where we're not. And so if we are really going to be serious about tackling the issue of mass incarceration and really sort of lifting up why after 50 years we are where we are, we are going to have to sort of uh, have that tough conversation. We're going to have to push folks who may be more uncomfortable with that conversation um, to really move the needle if we really want to actually actually move the needle right on the issue of mass incarceration. So I really sort of honed in on that and, and wouldn't leave without mentioning that racial justice piece, also a part of the issue of long sentences. I mean, it's really disturbing to see how many people, that disparity, right, in terms of who is serving 10 years or more. And so the issue of tackling extreme sentences um, is a racial justice piece. And so it's, it's, it's organizations who want to lift up the racial equity issue and really sort of hone in on that. We have to be at the forefront of the issue of long sentences, uh, violent offenses, and having those sort of uncomfortable, I would say uncomfortable conversations uh, with many stakeholders. And I know we'll get into that question later uh, around this issue. So touching on those two, and uh, again, glad to be here. Thank you so much, Monica, for um, the, and uh, to you, Ron, and to you, Ebony, for your thoughtful reactions and for partnering with us um, on this effort, and also want to extend our gratitude to other partners um, who aren't on the call and to everyone in the audience. Again, want to encourage folks to um, pose any questions in the Q&A function. I see a lot of um, information being shared in the chat, but if you do have questions, please share them in the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to them. We'll work to get to them um, when we turn to you all um, for your feedback and your, and your questions. You know, the Sentencing Project is a research and advocacy organization, but we know that behind each percentage point is a young Black man who's been disappeared to two extreme sentencing laws, um, much in what Nazgul covered in her earlier comments. And behind each data point is a graph, on the graph is a young Latina who has to visit their parents in a prison waiting room. And behind each statistic is an indigenous woman who lives the experience of failed policies for herself and her community. And behind each data set is a community like the one I grew up in, in North Houston, where incarceration was almost a norm for folks born in the 1970s and continues to be a norm in some high incarceration communities even today. And so I wanna pose a question to the panelists and to folks in the audience. You know, no doubt there are too many to name, but who among the incarcerated and or formerly incarcerated inspires you to participate in what we are launching today, this public education campaign or previewing today, we'll launch formally in a few weeks, this public education campaign, 50 years in a wake up and calling attention to the crisis of mass incarceration in America. Can you share their name? Can you bring them into the room in spirit, into the virtual Zoom room in spirit? Because we know that in addition to us doing this work here, we're also going to be doing this work in partnership and in collaboration with folks on the inside, inside the walls and the people who are living um, with the trauma and the horrors of mass incarceration um, after their sentence and also the family members who have suffered their disappearance. So Ebony, I'll start with you and then go to other panelists. Thank you, thank you. Gosh, there's so many people, right, that I wanna name. Um, but I would say the one formerly incarcerated person who inspired me all together to participate in this campaign and just be in this work it would be my father. I'd be remiss to not say my father, Bill Underwood. It, um, you know, my dad has been dedicated while he was incarcerated to my siblings and I. 
and he inspired us to just never give up hope. Um, while he was incarcerated, he was very present, although he was not physically present. During the 33 years of his incarceration, he was a relentless, committed father, making all efforts to maintain a relationship with all four of his children and his grandchildren. And he always remained in positive spirits, despite the fact that he had a life without parole sentence. So, you know, to echo what Monica was saying, it's so true. We have to look at those sentences that are really, really challenging and difficult because, you know, had it not been for his persistence and his for his fortitude to keep going forward, I don't know that I would have even started We Got Us Now or even had the, you know, the 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 ability to have started it. So through my advocacy, I learned that he was not alone that there are many incarcerated parents who remain connected to their children and wanna be reunited, right? And their children want that too. And so, you know, my dad and many other incarcerated parents and their children who love them despite their mistakes are who inspire me every day and who have inspired the launch of We Got Us Now. So thank you for that question, it's so important. There's so many people that I'd love to name, but my dad, Bill Underwood is the person. Thank you. And Monica, let's go to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. I sort of like I'm sort of going to do like a two-parter because I, I sort of want to lift up some of the work um, of a project and initiative of NACDL and of my colleagues. Um, and in that is the Return to Freedom Initiative. Um, and it's really sort of I'm sort of lumping in, and then I'm gonna go to a specific person, but lumping in sort of all of the, the applicants, recipients. Um, who have been granted um, either some type of pardon or clemency under the various sort of projects that they have um, been pursuing over the last couple of years. Um, I think each time we get, you know, have sort of a staff convening, you hear about sort of someone who's was granted either compassionate release or release after due to COVID or release because of, you know, a trial penalty issue and they served really excessive amount of sentences, um, you're sort of reinvigorated in terms of the work that we do, um, right? That this is what we're trying to do in terms of getting people, you know, they have already sort of experienced that injustice, but we are sort of doing what we can on the back end to get them released. And so sort of lifting up all of these sort of applicants uh, and grantees and recipients of the work under that Return to Freedom project. And also your question, it sort of, uh, brought to mind sort of uh, a trailblazer, I would say, um, and really sort of Glenn Martin. I know a lot of folks sort of know him by name, but um, I say that because sort of the half by, you know, 2023, it's a really uh, aggressive and sort of visionary sort of goal, right? And I think when we talk about this campaign, we are going to have to be sort of visionary, right? We have to think outside of the box. We're going to have to stretch our imagination, right? Like we are sitting at 50 years. We are you know, digesting the stats that we have been shared with um, and really sort of like, where do we go from here, right? We're sort of evaluating our past approaches, current approaches, what has worked, what hasn't. And I'm really sort of, and I'm sort of leaping into a response to, a, I'm sure another question, but really sort of needing to bring a lot of diverse perspectives into the room. And so when I think, and that's something that even challenges myself, and I think everyone can say in terms of when we're thinking through reforms and approaches to this issue, are we thinking big enough or are we sort of trying to work within the current system that we have already determined to be unequitable and racist and et cetera, et cetera. And so really sort of needing those diverse perspectives to challenge even our normal thinking, right? So we need the people who are trying to work within the system, but we also need the people who are trying to completely reimagine the system and some who are completely trying to disrupt uh, and burn it to the ground and start over. And so really sort of bringing diverse perspectives. And when I think of people uh, who, you know, sets a high goal and that challenges me, um, it really sort of moves or sort of continues to motivate me in terms of the work that we're doing to say that uh, the, the vision, the goal is not impossible. We just have to think about how we're going to get about getting to that goal. Thank you so much, Monica. And there's so many names being shared in the chat. So thank you all for sharing those. Um, Ron, did you wanna call anybody in? Sure, thank you for that question. As someone who spent 27 years on a wake up, <laughs> I have a, lots and lots of people that I that come to mind when that question was asked. And, but for me, I think it's a little more personal. Uh, my son, uh, my namesake Ronald, he served a few months in, in Michigan Department of Corrections some years back. And on Father's Day, 2001, he was shot and killed by a 14 year old juvenile in Flint, Michigan. 
and I forgave the child that that shot him and advocated for his um his um release. But in addition to that, my son's death is my is fuel for the work that I do. But in addition to that, his son was born two months after he was born, and he's 21 now, and he sit currently sitting in a prison in Kentucky. So my son and my grandson are my motivation for the work that I do and this restorative justice hope that I have for our country. Thank you so much for that. And sorry for your loss um, in the day to day, um, given your son's loss. Um, Naz, was there anyone else you wanted to call in? Sure. Um, someone who really inspired me to start thinking about life sentences was Flozell Woodmore, who uh, was released from a parole eligible life sentences after many denials from the parole board, even after the family members of her victim supported her release. And so I learned a lot about uh, the experience of the parole process from her, and she did a lot to guide others to navigate that process in California. And she unfortunately died a few years after she was released. And over the years of working on these issues, I familiar with others also who had a very long struggle to be released and and you know experience sudden death within a couple of years after and so I think that's always underscored for me the urgency in getting people out who don't need to be incarcerated so that they can make the most of the limited time that they have thank you thank you all and for me I want to call in a lot of the kids I grew up with um, in North Houston when I was growing up in the 90s, you know, what politicized me to this work is the realization that a bunch of guys that were in my age group ended up cycling in and out of jail in the mid to late 90s. So I want to call in my brother, Nick. I want to call in um, a friend who's gone on, Hank. I want to call in um, so many uh, who... <sighs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I did not realize I was gonna cry like that, but I really do think that the um, you know, there's a generation of people who've been lost over the last 50 years, many of whom I grew up with and who the trauma of incarceration severely impacted, not just them, but their families. And so hopefully this work will really help um address that and you know, really move us in the direction and help do the public education work that's necessary. So you know, we, ha uh, we have a couple of questions. I don't think we're gonna get to them all because I wanna get to the Q&A, um, the questions in the Q&A and encourage others to, um, in the audience to post those questions in the Q&A. But there is one last question. Uh, well, there's two questions that hopefully we can get to and then we'll turn to the um, questions in the Q&A box and one, is um, you know what has to be different about the approach this year, given the work that we've been doing, that all of our respective organizations have been doing, the work that many advocacy and research organizations and grassroots organizations have been doing, but what has to be different about our approach this year to uh, meaningfully call attention to the fact that 2023 is the 50th year of incarceration? mass incarceration. And we'll start with you, Nazgul, and then um, go to other panelists. Oh, gosh. Um, I'm not sure that I'm the best suited person to answer this question. So, I mean, I think from the perspective of a as a researcher, our goal is to really encourage um, people who are working on these issues from the in the advocacy space and to uh and to embolden lawmakers and criminal justice practitioners to be big and bold in the reforms that they're pursuing and to make sure that they have the data that they need uh to support that and so that's um that's that's my brief answer and i really want to hear from the other panelists about this sure let's get it you on the first thing I would say, we have to start working in silos. We have to have a lot, lot more collaboration. I, I've discovered, you know, through the work that we do with Just Leadership, we, we are part of like 15 different coalitions. <laughs> and I've discovered that the impact that we have is much more uh, effective because we, we're not working in such a siloed way. Because a lot of the organizations 
they kind of, you know, they get tunnel vision because they're working on one issue and they won't have ears for what everybody else is doing. If we can share resources, at least informational resources around what everybody's doing and we can share the work that we're doing, we could move, we could do a, a lot as far as moving this needle around criminal justice reform, around policy work. And just the, we everybody informs everybody else. So that's the first thing I suggest that we should do. And then we should also start working on having heart and mind change. I always say that we need to be about the business and putting the humanity back into being human. All the legislative uh, changes in the world, is, they can be changed by a stroke of a pen, which we see every administration. But once you have heart and mind change, you, it makes reform sustainable. So I think we need to have heart and mind change and more collaboration. Ebony and Monica, Ebony. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, for me, I always believe that mass incarceration um, is a tsunami, but this tsunami is it's not a monolithic tsunami, right? Like it has so many tentacles and the rippling effects, um, many of us beyond childhood um, into adulthood. Um, I mean, you just referring to people that you grew up with now, even it's still affecting you, even in this moment, right? To watch Nicole and just see the emotions. Like a lot of us are walking around with this trauma. Um, and so like five decades later, we have to be talking about this. We have to be in community. We have to be in collaboration. We have to be in coalition with one another so that we can really get to the root of this devastation and begin to work in a more humane way. Um, I'll, I'll also share that, you know, five decades ago, these public policies were instituted calling for the war on drugs. And you know, of course, they've had these now that we all know detrimental consequences because of these policies to millions of children and millions of family. And we need to know what happened, right? The general public doesn't really know. I mean, if you've been affected, then you know. But if you if have not been affected, so many people do not understand all of what really truly happens and how our love is often monetized um, for families and you know loved ones that want to support their family members who have, have these draconian sentences and are just locked away for decades. We need to know the history, not just in our community, but beyond our community. So 50 years now, we gotta, we have to wake up. This is a wake up. We have to begin to have this conversation because the decisions and the policies that we put forth today are going to affect the next 50 years and we must do better. Thank you and Monica. Yeah, I wanna echo something that Ron had said because he's talked about heart and mind change and I would sort of add to that. I think we need, it's a, it's a cultural shift that we need to make um, and it's not, easy, right? Because we also need to sort of target uh, this, you know, campaign and the narrative in a way that's easily digestible to the public. Like we on this call, on this panel, on this call, probably understand sort of the, uh, you know, we understand the connection between why, you know, uh, long sentences are, don't serve as a deterrent and we accept them, right? But people have this sort of innate something in them that's like, no, you know, that, you know, naturally sort of bucks at a lot of the evidence that we talk about, a lot of the stats that we talk about, and when feeling um, concerned and when there's issues of safety, and I know we, you know, you should have brought in or someone brought up sort of like the, the narrative that we're currently in in terms of brown safety, maybe I saw it in the chat too, um, you know, they have sort of like a knee-jerk reaction to just go back to what feels normal, I guess I'll say, um, but we know that whatever that normal is, it's not working, right? If it was working, then we wouldn't be here, right? We wouldn't be having this conversation. So there really does need to be like a cultural shift and it needs to target the general public. We need to understand that why continuing just to pump money into systems that have proven not to work is not the solution, not just to give more money, right? Expecting a different outcome when we have proven that these systems don't work, that we have proven that long sentences don't work, that people age out of crime, as, as Nasbo had mentioned, and other sort of stats that we have long um, talked about. We you know, deal with issues around sex offenses, which no one seems to want to talk about or tackle. And they are the category of individuals that unfortunately gets aloft and carved out of any reform, right? But science does not back the concerns, right, that people have, they don't back sex offender registries. And so there's something there we need to shift 
um, from around a very punitive approach to everything, we criminalize everything, right? We criminalize the mundane, you know, these sort of issues around like voting rights. We we're talking about criminalizing handing out water to people in line. So we are excessive in how we deal with society's ills. We need a cultural change. We need to understand, get it in a way that the public can understand and we can talk to uh, those who are in decision making positions to why uh, these policies that we've been pushing uh, for so long aren't working and pushing them continually is not going to continue to work, right? It's not going to work at all. Um, and so there's really like a cultural shift and hoping with the campaign and the people that have been brought together who have said, I'm willing to work in coalition and collaboration that we can sort of look at what is it that is missing, right? I, I said in my first comment, sort of like, we're all re even reevaluating at this period, you know, what we've done in the past, or right? Like, how can we uh, sort of help facilitate that shift and really sort of drive home into why evidence based why pumping, you know, resources into community services and community organizations is a way to sort of disrupt uh, this and, and other systems, as opposed to continuing to pump them into more punitive systems, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a really a cultural shift and we, you know, that we need to happen. And hopefully all of the great minds, <laughs> we can sort of come to something that can sort of work and we can start making movement on uh, the issues of violent offenses and other extreme sentences that are still, you know, pump fueling mass incarceration. Because again, we are not going to get at the numbers uh, that NASCO talked about if we are not uh, tackling reforms that target those issues. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Thank you all um, for joining us, for your words, and for the energy and the words um, being shared in the chat as well. So we're going to turn it over to Q&A from the audience. Um, and then, but I'm going to start us off there with who, what other movements should we make sure to connect with over the next um, 12 months over the next year as we continue to push forward and move on raising awareness that 2023 is the 50th year of mass incarceration. And all of you um, come off to um, share any thoughts or reactions to that question, and then we'll turn it over um, to Q&A from the audience. But any thoughts on what other movements that we should make sure to connect with and partner with over the next year? Ebony, Ebony and then Ron. I mean, for me personally, you know, because it's children and the effects that it has on so many different aspects of our lives. If you think about all the people that intersect with people with children, so the educational space is huge. Educational institutions, healthcare institutions, um, uh, so many different other spaces. Like we need to be talking to judges. We need to be talking to prosecutors. We need to be talking to everyone, the world needs to know. We need to talk to everyone because as everybody in, at some point in their, in their lives have been affected. People are touched by this, either physically touched by it or, you know, as a byproduct of their environment or people that they know. So we have to begin to have these conversations. They have to be in spaces. We have to be everywhere. Thank you. And Ron, you come off me. Did you have anything? No, I, I, no, I was thinking, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else before we move into Q&A from the audience, Monica? Yeah, it's so hard. I know there's a lot of groups that are probably already involved, but sort of echoing Ebony, because I think, you know, trying to think of sort of untra even untraditional partners, um, we had uh, sort of a, a, a event or web or uh, in-person event that sort of focused on sort of non cultural investments to to reduce crime and safety and a lot of the sort of when I think of like partners and solutions we're not non-criminal justice I mean we're talking about like employment and housing and um, health and so there's like a lot of and especially when we see sort of the over criminalization sort of banner right in terms of issues um, those who are working in, in substance use and abuse and so really thinking beyond even probably actually a lot of our normal partners to really sort of bring in people to the conversation because over is tackling all of these sort of issues, right? And so bringing in people in those industries who are focused, you know, I know corporate and employers, et cetera, you know, really are involved in sort of like the issues of collateral consequences and making sure people uh, can get, get employment, right? And so bringing in and continuing to look how uh, maybe untraditional partners and bringing them into the conversation um, because the tentacles of this, of mass incarceration is sort of touching on uh, many industries. 
Thank you. So Ebony, um, come, um, do you have anything else to share there? Yeah, I wanted to say one other thing. I want to also say that so many of us um, have been impacted and just don't have answers. So I feel like this conversation is 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 so important and necessary for us to just be in community to be able to learn. I remember myself like having to navigate the system and just trying to figure it out. There are no instructions for how to do this effectively. So us being able to bring forth solutions and just advice, right, around how to best support for our grandmoms, for our, you know, for the moms that are out there that are wanting to help with their children and don't know how to potentially visit a, a loved one that's in a federal prison in three states away, you know, just understanding the, the, the tactics of how do you get through this? People need to know. So I want to just make sure that we don't forget just the people, the people that are impacted, but also the greater public. We all need to know because I, be, I believe like this is a societal issue that if we don't, if we don't address, we're just putting another band-aid over a bullet wound and it's still going to bleed. So we have to do something different. Thank you, thank you. So let's go to Q and A um, and bring in questions from the audience. There's a lot of questions in there. So Morgan, um, did you uh, want to get us started with any one that um, you thought was helpful to start with? Well, I think a lot of people want to know how they can be engaged with the campaign. So you know, if I think if you guys want to jump in and give next steps for folks on the call, that'd be great. Sure. Well. Please um, mark your calendars for February 8th, which will be the official launch day. Again, we're going to be releasing some trailblazing research on that day, um, and we hope that you will plan to join us and continue to promote the campaign on social media. Take a look at the media kit, the social media kit that's available from uh, the Sentencing Project's website. And there are ways that you can share out information um, related to the campaign following the official launch in February. Again, this was a preview conversation. We wanted to connect with our advocacy partners, um, including um, Ebony and Monica and Ron, who joined us today, and others who are in the audience. Um, and then, you know, join us as partners over the next year to make sure to work with us as we um, continue efforts around this public education effort, calling attention to 2023 as the 50th year of mass incarceration. Any other calls to action from you all um, that you want to suggest to folks in the audience? Yeah, real briefly, I'll jump in here. Uh, Just Leadership, we launched what's called the Justice Coordinating Council, which is going, it's a round table made, for, made up of former incarcerated leaders around the country that's coming together to help drive policy and, and, and uh, reform on the national level. And so we having a launch in April during Second Chance Month, and we uh, reserved a spot on the, on the mall in D.C., and we're going to have a, a thing out there on the mall. We go to our website map, I put it here on in the chat, Go to our website for more information, and we hope to see you there. You can link up with us, and we can help you with the process of advocating for us. Thank you. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, Ebony, Monica? I, I would just say that, of course, you know, We Got Us Now, we have a flagship program. Our flagship program is the We Got Us Now Actionist Leadership Program. That's where we actively engage daughters and sons who are directly impacted by parental incarceration and have a proven commitment to want to reform the criminal legal system. And so, uh, you know, we've had two successful uh, or three successful cohorts thus far, and we've been able to pass legislation, two at the national level, two at the state level and one at the local level and we're always looking for daughters and sons who want to be able to join our community unfortunately having a, a parent incarcerated uh, for a child um, has caused a lot of shame for our community so this is a historically invisible population so if you like to learn more if you want to be connected to we got us now if you just want to be an ally um, and in support of our work please go to we got us now.org um, we got us now.org is our website and you know i'm just happy to be in this community of course go to the sensing project as well <laughs> go to their website and stay connected because we have so much more to come and Monica. Awesome. Yeah, I would just echo. Um, so I think over the course of the year, obviously, since this is going to be a year year long campaign, we also will be in coordination and collaboration with the campaign and also sort of uplifting um, some of the current policies, projects, initiatives that NACL currently does. 
uh, that sort of helps to alleviate mass incarceration. And so I would encourage you, um, if interested, you know, you can visit our website as well, NACL.org. Um, we'll be sort of lifting up and centralizing a lot of the activities that we do around this campaign specifically, but also year round, uh, a lot of our projects that we do that sort of look at uh, alleviating mass incarceration. You can sign up if you do visit the website. You can also sign up to receive sort of actions. And so as we're sort of moving about these state legislative sessions, we're currently in session in federal um, and where there's ways to sort of engage and reach out and contact your elected official on policies that are looking at uh, different issues around mass incarceration. I would encourage you to do that. I think I referenced our Return to Freedom Project, and I will say that again because they're always looking for pro bono attorneys to help take uh, cases for people who have applied to the different projects and initiatives. Again, a lot of them tackle cannabis uh, specific uh, convictions, child penalty, excessive sentencing, compassionate release, et cetera. I'm sure I'm missing one, um, but we are always looking for pro bono attorneys to help with those cases. So I would encourage you to go to the website and visit as well. And again, we'll be sort of releasing as this campaign unfolds throughout the year, we will continue sort of updating and releasing um, sort of actions, materials, et cetera, in terms of how people can engage um, and help uh, alleviate this and elevate the campaign. So. Thank you. And then Nasbo, do you want to preview anything that the research that the sentencing projects research team is planning for this year? Sure. Well, we have a number of reports planned around thinking about some of the drivers of extreme sentences and highlighting some of the reforms that can help to scale back these very long sentences. Um, in addition, we're going to be working on um, releasing updated materials about racial disparities. And again, coupling that with highlight highlights of reforms around the country that are trying to tackle the sources of racial disparities so that where we can see something is moving in the right direction, we can help to encourage that to be serve as a model for the rest of the country. Wonderful. Morgan, any other questions that we want to ask before we, um, we get to the top of the hour? Um, I think a lot of people have questions about um, does the sentencing project support this initiative or is this a priority for the coalition? Um, what if we want to talk about just people convicted of nonviolent offenses versus other people focused on people convicted of violent offenses? So I don't know if you have information you want to share in general about um, people being able to join who are at different points in their journey for reform and have different priority areas, if there's any guidance towards that. Yes. Well, I think in order to effectively have this conversation over the next year, we're, we welcome everyone. Um, wherever you're, however you've been politicized or whatever work that you're carrying to help challenge mass incarceration. So we um, encourage you to be in touch with the Sentencing Project. I know that um, the link to our website and information about the campaign and the narrative documents that provide a background for the campaign have been shared in the chat. Um, folks can feel free to reach out to me directly um, and I'll put my email in the chat if you want to touch base and follow up on ways that you can connect and partner with us over the next year. I think throughout the year we will be planning um, public education events. We view this as a public education campaign, so we hope you take the narrative documents and use them, leverage them for the work that you're doing in your community or within your organizations. Um, there's a range of things that everyone can do um, as a follow-up to this conversation in the official launch in February. You can host conversations in your within your organization, within your community, at your local library. You can um, share the social media assets that we will make available from our uh, from our website. Um, you can participate in the virtual and in-person public education events that we will schedule over the next year. So there's a range of things and we will continue to update you. We continue to invite you to be in touch with us and to follow up. I know there's a partner who's not on um, the call who hopefully is in the audience. They are planning a Bible study, a Lenten study, 
focused on mass incarceration. They have recruited faith leaders from around the country to contribute readings um, for that Bible study. And um, that will culminate around Easter, um, which is in Second Chance Month. And Ron mentioned Second Chance Month earlier on the call. So there's a range of activities that have already been planned and that will be planned throughout the year. And we invite all of you to continue to partner with us and connect with us as we move forward in that. Any other questions? One last question um, before you wrap up. Um, I think the only other uh, questions we've got are about the data and if there's other data that Nazgul and the Sentencing Project has uh, that covers racial disparities uh, beyond just Black Americans. Great. Yeah. So take a look at the trends report that we put out today that provides an overview and explore our website. If you would like to have more beyond that and you're not finding it, feel free to re reach out to us among the research team. You feel free to reach out to me. Um, and I also included a link in the Q&A to a National Academies report on racial disparities, which has a, a very, uh, uh, which is very comprehensive, includes figures on American Indians. Um, and I'd be happy to help folks access that and interpret that if helpful. Great, thank you. Thank you, Nasbo. So folks, um, we're at the top of the hour. Please do um, reach out to me and to Nasbo with questions on the data. Um, and then for me uh, to continue questions or a conversation about partnering with us over the next year. They want to thank Ebony, Ron, and Monica for joining us um, on behalf of your organizations this afternoon. And folks, this is not, this is the beginning of a year long journey together. So, you know, we are so excited to have you with us. Um, and as I mentioned, following this call, we'll share partner toolkits with each of you. You can find that already available on our website. And inside the toolkit, you'll find helpful resources, including talking point statistics, a link to logo files. Some people have, some organizational partners are reusing those files um, to align with their messaging, with their branding. And we encourage you all to do that. You'll also find a narrative template that can be used to describe this campaign in written materials and social media guidance. So please mark your calendars. The official launch is February 8th. On that day, we will release some trailblazing research spearheaded by the research team, including Nazgul. And we hope that you will plan to join us for a virtual press event at 11 a.m. Eastern um, and promote the campaign on social media on that day. Again, this was a preview conversation. We wanted to call in our advocacy partners, um, the formal partners, including We Got Us Now, Just Leadership USA, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, the Brennan Center, the Vera Institute for Justice, the ACLU, the Festival Center, and so many more and all of you who are in the audience too. So reach out, connect, be on this journey with us over the next year and help us call attention to the fact that 2023 is 50 years of mass incarceration and it's time for America to wake up and deal with it. All right, thank you all.